everybody. Yeah, some warm applause for Lauren Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll say this, that there's no worse feeling than looking at a conference program and seeing that you're the speaker after Mike. So uh, I am not going to take you on a wild ride through history. Thank you for all of that, Mike. Uh, we're back in 2014, uh, and the innovation that's happening now is very much centered around APIs. Um, and just raise your hands. How many of you are repeat offenders? How many people have gone to more than one API conference this year? Yeah, a lot of us, right? We're sort of addicts. And Mike and I actually were at one this summer, and we were having a conversation about why is that? Why are we all gathering so frequently and talking about APIs? I don't know about you guys, but you know, I was building APIs, working with APIs decades ago. And we really didn't talk about them because they were the most boring thing on earth. But now they've become kind of front and center. And one of the reasons that we all gather so frequently and talk so deeply about APIs is because it is the way of the future, right? We're seeing a lot of technology doors opening right now because of APIs. And in some way, we're like, you know, Mike and I were saying to each other, we're like one big extended design review team, right? We're talking about strategy. We're talking about monetizing. We're talking about technology. We're talking about APIs top to bottom, trying to figure out how do we use them in ways that make sense? So one of the things that I want to talk about is, um, yeah, do we have a clicker? Um, is what does it mean to say your API is ready? So we talk about product readiness. If anybody's been in software development for any length of time, you've been talking about product readiness for years. It's time for all of us to start talking about API readiness. What does it mean to say your API is ready? Um, and that's not working. I can just do this. Uh, so we get together at these conferences, and we talk pretty frequently about what makes a good API. What, what makes it a successful API program? First and foremost, you need to document it. Right? You need to make sure people know what it does. You need to have some level of testing, and I'm going to talk about that more in a bit. Um, mocking. So mocking has become something that people are talking about more frequently, and people are building the capabilities um, to allow people to generate mock services. And we'll talk about why that's important as well. And evangelism. So we spend a lot of time focused on API evangelism and developer evangelism. We host hackathons. We try to get people to use our APIs and understand our APIs. And, of course, there's quite a number of API management vendors here. Uh, that's become a standard. It used to be sort of an anomaly, right? It was something that you had to explain what is API management. More and more, as we start to realize how complicated it is to monitor the traffic on your API, to rate limit your API, to monetize your API. M managing your API has become sort of a standard activity. And likewise, monitoring. So I used to go to conferences two years ago and talk about API monitoring, and I was the only person doing it. I was sort of in these little side rooms with like five people in front of me and talking about API monitoring. Now people are really getting the concept that you have to make sure your API is performing and is up and running and, and know how it's being used. So API monitoring has become a big thing. But what's important about all of this? Well, what's important about all of this is that these are constant conversations that we're all having, but we're having them in these conferences, very focused on developers. We're trying to get developers to use our APIs. We want to document them for developers to use them. We want to evangelize them for developers to use them. I want to take it to the next step. So uh, a big part of API readiness 
is about getting the non-technical people to understand what your API does, and it's getting the end users, making sure that your API is ready for those end users of the applications that use your API. The difference between product readiness and API readiness is that product readiness is always focused on the end user of the application. API readiness has to focus on multiple layers. You have to focus on both your developers who are going to use your API and their end users. So who's using the application that uses your API? OK, so we've been talking about documentation. Documentation for your API is very important in order to make your API a visual entity. So human beings are wired for visuals, right? If I ask you, how do I get from here to somewhere else, the first thing you're going to want to do is draw me a map, right? We think in visuals. That's why when we're designing applications, we wireframe. So we can get a sense of what does this look like? How, do we, how does it function? How do I work my way through it? And of course, the problem that we've always struggled with with APIs is there's no UI. There's, there's no visual. So we've got a lot of service descriptions that have come along to try to solve that problem. Again, we need to think outside of the developer realm and think about how do you make your API visual for all of the people who care about your API? So this isn't just a developer's game anymore, right? Product managers are coming to people and saying, we need an API. I need, I need an API that does the following three things. Now, if you walked up to your product manager and said, here's my service description, is this what you wanted? Your product manager is going to just stare at you blankly. And, and listen, don't get into a document war with a product manager ever. Because they're going to say, well, here's my PRD. Here's my PRD. Let me, let me see if your service description matches my PRD, right? So, so you don't want to get into that. And this is where mocking becomes very important. Because if you're using service, some of these service descriptions are designed for people to visualize the API. We've gone past Wisdom and Waddle, right? We're, we're inventing ways to make this more tangible for the people in the business side, for the people who have to test this, for the people who have to incorporate it into their applications. So if you also go beyond the service description and add in mocking, right? If you can generate a mock service for your API and let people touch it, let them play with it, let them actually see what happens. If I make a request, how does it respond, right? It's important in this, as, as we're expanding the role of APIs in software development, that we manage this initial stage. Again, this is still fairly internally focused, right? So we're talking about people who are going to, to be close and surround that API. So it's not the end user. It's not the person who's using the banking app. It's the person building the banking app, right? But you need to make sure your API is ready by making sure that it meets the requirements that you've been given. And those requirements can be tough to quantify. If you've got end users, if you've got a public API, for example, and you're putting it out there and you want a lot of people to build applications, you have to constantly stay vigilant for what they're asking for. And giving them a visual model of your API will help that communication. And then, please, so validate your API. What does that mean? It means test your shit. So we have a lot of people who say, yeah, yeah, I tested my API. And, and I work for a company that builds API testing tools. So we've seen sort of the gamut. The reality is a lot of people, when they say they've tested their API, they're talking about smoke tests, right? And I'm not disparaging smoke tests. They're great. They're very important. But what do they do? A smoke test is a happy path, right? A smoke test says, 
yep, it does what I thought it was going to do. Right? And if it doesn't, great, I'll fix that. But it isn't full-blown testing. So if you're going to validate your API, and you do want to validate your API, because the deal is you built it, you should test it. And that means more than just smoke testing. That means the whole range of functional testing. Right? You need to make sure this thing works. So you want to do your, your uh, regression testing. You want to validate that it meets the requirements through testing, not just by handing it to your product manager and saying, what do you think? Right? Um, you want to do some integration testing. So you need to make sure that you've spent the time validating that your API does what you said it was going to do. I got news for you. I've run development teams. I've run testing teams. If you're building an application, you are testing the application. Now, by doing that, you're passively testing the API. But the reality is most application testers are not really focused on API testing. So you'll surface some things. If you're relying on putting this into production and having application testers test it, you'll surface some things. But they're after the fact, which always makes it harder to fix. And you're not going to surface everything you would surface if you really tested that API directly. But it's more than functional testing. It's load testing. So how many people, and I'm sure everybody does, how many people remember the old fail whale days of Twitter? Right? They've gone past that. I, you rarely see a fail whale anymore. But that was all about success. Right? That, that was Twitter's success that killed them. They would get overloaded, and they would start to fail. So what you don't want is for your own success, because so many people adopted your API, and oh, by the way, if you've made your API available for a lot of application developers, guess what? Their success is going to increase the load on your API. So you actually have, have created this unpredictable world of, of usage. So you need to make sure that before you put it out there that you've load tested it. You know what the thresholds are. And by knowing what the thresholds are, you can set the right rate limits. Right? So you can say, we're, we're going to cap this at x number of, of requests because we know we're going to fail under if, if it gets to be more than that. Right? So it's not so much that, that you need to modify your API, you may need to modify how your API is used. Again, this is all part of being ready for the application uh, developers to build with your API. In the end, they're going to look at your API as part of their product, because it looks to their end users like part of your pro their product. And that means they're going to run their load tests. They're going to hit your API as they're running their load tests. And they're going to reject your API in the end if you're impacting their performance. So it's an important step to make sure that you've load tested your API and you know and can communicate what your thresholds are. And then there's security testing, which how many people actually do security testing on their APIs? Oh, a couple of hands. That's good. There's somebody out there. Good, yeah. Oh, more and more going up now, right. Um, OK, so we like to say at my company, you do not want to be the next person on the news, right? Because security breaches land you on the news. But the reality is it's more than that. It, it's, it's ensuring that your customers can rely on you, that people who are building applications using your API can rely on you. And I love this cartoon because this is exactly what it's like. You know there's something behind you, right? And you know it's big and bad. But you're not doing anything about it. You're just kind of wandering around going, I don't know, is it safe? Is it safe? So make sure you're doing your security testing. And this can come in all forms, right? You, you want to make sure that you're focusing your efforts where it matters to you. 
So, you know, if, if you believe that your API is something that may be uh, particularly vulnerable to SQL injections, then you should test that. You should make sure that you know where your vulnerabilities are and solve them before somebody else finds a way in. Right? And this is especially important if you are providing APIs for other people to consume, if this is an API that is be being used outside your own organization. Because you are then compromising their application as well. Okay, so we talked about visualizing your API and making sure that other people can visualize it. We've talked about validating your API, and that's more than just functional testing. That's functional testing, it's load testing, it's security testing. It's truly making sure that your API is as rock solid as you can make it. We are relying on APIs for a lot of things these days that are that are very sensitive, important applications. So when you're talking about healthcare applications or finance applications, it's really important that you go through some of this, particularly the security testing. So what happens now? Now you say, OK, my API is fantastic. I'm ready. So what happens to your application testers? They're just going to have to trust you, right? They're just going to have to say, yep, I, I'm pretty sure he told me he did all of this testing, so I'm pretty sure this API is going to work. Well, the problem that application testers have, and they've learned to just accept it as a problem, as, as opposed to figuring out what to do about it, is that they can't mimic with an API the same kinds of things they can mimic with an application. So they can set up tests in their application that will fail, right? They can check to see if I force this error message, what do, what do I do? What does my application do, right? What does that error message even look like? They have a lot of trouble doing that at the API level. So how do you solve that? Well, the best way to solve that is to give them a sandbox. Create virtual versions of your API and put them on a server where people can access them. So now they can generate failure conditions. They can say, OK, this, this API, I want it to throw an error that says I don't have permission. I don't have authority to access it. And let me see what my application does in response to that. I want to set up you know, some, some constrained bandwidth on this API, and I want to see what my application does. They're not testing your API, because guess what? That's not their job. That's your job. So they're not testing your API. They're testing their application. So what happens if that, app, that API is overloaded? What happens if it's not performing the way it should? What happens if, it lost, uh, if I lost it, if it went out from underneath me? What does my application do in response to that? I used to have this great, and I wish I had put it in here, this great uh, screenshot of, I'm a, so I'll admit it, I'm a Candy Crush addict. I love Candy Crush. And uh, one morning, I was playing it, and I got an API error. And I was so astounded that I'm in the middle of trying to do a really cool move, and here comes an API error. And I thought, you know what? I know what the hell an API is, but how many Candy Crush users are out there going, what? What did I just do? I broke F Candy Crush for everybody, right? So you want to make sure that your application is never showing an API error, right? And that's, and that's where you can help your application testers and your application folks by creating a virtual version of your API. Put it out on a server. Let them simulate the failures they need to simulate so their application is better. So if your API fails, which it never would, but if your API fails, they can respond to that before they go to production. And the, oh, I'm sorry about my slides. I don't know how to fix that. But um, so. By virtualizing the APIs, as I said, 
you are also protecting your production APIs. So now you're giving your, your external developers and testers a way to test against your virtual APIs while your production APIs stay safe. Um, and this is where monitoring comes in, right? So now, now when you monitor your production APIs, you can do it in a way that makes sense. You are truly monitoring production usage of your APIs. So you've got the people who are doing their, oh, and my one and only animation, this is to compete with Mike's video, is on the floor, unfortunately. But um, so, so you, can, you can make sure that you can have your ongoing development and your production usage protected here, while your third parties are all doing their development and testing against the virtual APIs. It gives them a way to make their application better because they can generate failures before they go to production and make sure they're handling them. And it gives you a way to keep your API stable and protected. All right, so we promised I would ask you this question, so I will. Are you ready? So, four things to remember about making sure your API is really ready. Visualize, validate, virtualize, and monitor. All right, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. We have time for two questions. Oh, one. Hello. Uh, what do you think the role of standardization in this is? Because I think a lot of us have done the experience where you implement something really cool with an API, and then you want to reuse it with another one, and it just doesn't work because the API looks in a completely different way. Right. Um, so the question was about standardization, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very good question, and it's something that I think we're all struggling with right now. That's why we have so many service description languages, right? There are so many ways to attack this, and I, I honestly believe that um, we are maturing as an API-focused industry, but we aren't there yet. I actually believe that, uh, and this is my own personal belief, is that we, we don't need to standardize yet. I think we're still at a very innovative stage, and we're learning a lot about our mistakes, and we're learning a lot about our successes. And while it's frustrating to, <laughs> to have to adapt to each individual API, I think that we are probably, uh, my sense is we're still a few years away from saying, okay, he, we've really got it now. And I'll tell you what, it's like any technology. As soon as we say we've really got it, here's our standard, we're going to break that standard and innovate in a different way. So it's, it's a little hard to herd the cats, I think, sometimes. OK, great talk. Thanks so much. Um, I got the monitoring, virtualization, validation. I got all that. Do you have some examples of visualizing APIs? What's some good examples of that? Uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have them. But um, I will say that some of the, if you go to some of the portals that exist right now, Tesla is actually a really good one that's on, uh, if you look at their uh, developer portal, you can see, you can interact with the documentation. Uh, a lot of the API management platforms, they have interactive documentation where you can actually play with it, right? You can touch it, you can send a request and you can see what it responds with. So when I talk about visualizing the API, it's really a matter of interacting with it in a way that lets me touch it, you know? So I can, I can, I can send a request and I can see what the response is and I can traverse it. So a lot of the current service description languages, you know, uh, RAML and Blueprint and Swagger, you can actually work your way down through, and IODOC, sorry, uh, you can actually work your way down through the API and see what kind of um, requests you can make and what kind of responses it will give. Um, one thing that we're working on right now in partnership with Kin Lane actually is a true visual map uh, that is 
you know, as I said, the first thing you're going to want to do when I ask you for directions is draw me a map. And so we've been talking with him about doing the same kind of thing, actually creating a map, a visual map. But for right now, the best way to visualize is by using a service description language that lets you interact with it. So will we visualize APIs like Mike and Munson were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. maps and linking and like all the great uh, uh, thought uh, computer uh, scientists were, 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 thinking it, were making it 100 years ago? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there is a continuity in the talk, right? Okay. So thank you very much, Lorinda. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.